Hey guys, in this video I will continue showing you different types of movement. Last time we finished on our character shooting bullets. For a lot of games an important functionality when shooting is having a trajectory for our projectiles. To do that there are multiple ways, but a more accurate one will be by simulating physics. Simulating physics means that we are literally shooting our bullet and saving the path that it goes through. That's why we are first creating a new bullet and shoot it out. Now, if we don't do anything else and keep it at just shooting it, it will work as a normal mechanic, which we do not want. That's why the next part is very important. By setting physics to D, simulation mode to script, we are taking control when the physics in our game should be updated, which will be every time we call physics to D.simulate. So if you want to save the first 50 points with the position from our projectile, we create a loop that will simulate the physics every iteration. And on every iteration, we save the bullet position to our vector array. After that, we are using line renderer to display the actual line for the trajectory. And past the array, we just filled with the positions. To finish, return the simulation back to how it was, to fixed update, because we no longer want to manage it ourselves and delete the bullet that was being simulated. As we can see, it's a simple solution and works very well. But as you might have guessed, there are some issues that might come by doing that. We need to handle all physics in the game while simulating. So either we need to have no physics other than the trajectory simulation, or handle them all, which can be very frustrating and not optimal. So one thing we can do here is just making sure that we are executing the trajectory code only when the rotation changes. This is just a cheap trick, but it does the job in this case. But if I try to shoot it without handling it properly, as we can see it doesn't work like we want. We have to stay perfectly still to work as intended, which might be what you want, but let's see with the next example how we can fix that. Again we're going to be simulating physics, because it's just the most easy and accurate way of doing this. But instead of handling the physics simulation in the same scene, as everything else, we just create a new scene that will be specifically for doing that. So to do that, we need to have all our objects that are going to be interacting with the projectile and put it in that scene. This is why I have created a tag that's called stop bullet, and everything that is going to be interacting with the projectile is going to be using it. And also we're going to instantiate everything with the tag stop bullet in the physics scene. For example, currently the only thing that is going to be there is our ground. When we instantiate the objects that we want, just move them with move game object to scene. Now that we have our physics scene, the next step is almost exactly the same as the previous example. The difference here is that every time we create our bullet that is going to be simulated, we are adding it to the simulation scene and also remove the simulation mode because we no longer need it. Everything else is as it is and by doing just that, there is no longer need for us to be checking if we have stopped rotating to shoot, because now our physics are calculated on a separate scene and we can rotate and shoot at the same time. And if we have other physics as well, nothing will be bugging out as it did before. Now that we have the trajectory, let's improve it. Currently our bullet is just dropping on the ground and having no interactions with it. This might be intended in some cases, but let's add some bounciness to it. To do that we need to create a new physics material and set some value to the bounciness. Then add that material to the rigid body of our bullet. Only by doing this, now our bullet is bouncing off the ground and the trajectory is also being updated accordingly. Next let's see how we can change the style of the trajectory line. You can make almost anything because the way this works is by using shaders and materials. In our case we are using shader that will let us create a dotted effect. The shader allows us to manage the number of dots and the spacing between them. I'm going to attach a link to it in the description. When we have our material, go to the line renderer and add it as material there. Another options we can tweak are the color and the thickness of the line. By tweaking those parts we can create a very interesting styles for our trajectory. Another thing that you might want to have is displaying the trajectory line only for a specific objects. For example, we can have these circles and we only want to display the full trajectory when we are aiming at the green circles. If we aim at the red ones, we should stop it there. To do that, we are going to store all red circle colliders in a list, and while we are iterating and doing the simulation, we are going to check if our bullet is touching the collider of the red circle. If it is, then we break the loop. 
so it does not continue. That's why we're also setting the line render count at the end, because we're unaware how many total points we're going to be simulating. Now let's improve our projectile by adding a trail to it. To the data inside the bullet prefab, add a trail component. As you can see, it's very similar to the line renderer. By changing the width value, we can make one side thinner than the other. And also for our colors, change the alpha, so it looks like it's fading away. In my case, that's plenty, but you can tweak yours more. Until now, every time we shoot, we're using the same speed for the bullet. Let's make it so when we hold on the space key, the speed will change every frame from 0 to maximum 10 speed. We need a variable that will detect when the key is pressed, and every frame it is, we're going to save the elapsed time in a variable. Then instead of passing the fixed speed like before, we can learn between 0 and the maximum speed, which we will reach if we hold the spacebar, for 2 or more seconds. By doing that, we can see that our trajectory changes accordingly to our speed. Now let's see how we can do it by dragging our mouse. For that, let's detect when we are dragging the mouse and also the start position of our drag. What we are interested in is the y-axis, because that's how our weapon rotates. To limit the speed, let's use clamp function. And then we just calculate the speed based on how much the mouse has dragged. These were a couple of examples how to work with projectile trajectory. For the next example, let's look at creating a magnet. The idea here is that we want to shoot our magnet and attach it to the object in front. To find what's in front of our character, we're going to use physics raycast. This should say ray and detects any objects that it goes through. For the first parameter, we pass the start position. For the second, the direction. And for the third parameter, we pass how long we want it to be. For the fourth parameter, we can pass what kind of objects we want to detect. In our case, we're going to detect anything that has the tag grab. To check if something is hit, we just check if the collider is no or if it's not. We set a boolean variable should as true because we want only if there is an object in front to be able to shoot the magnet. When we have the object that is in front, it's very easy to calculate our distance from the starting position to it. Then set some speed and create a lerp that will move our magnet from the starting position to the object in front, which again includes only the objects that are with the grab tag. You can also choose to detect multiple tags, depends what you need. Next, instead of always shooting, let's add a condition, so when we click our mouse we can bring the magnet back and lock it. When the magnet is locked, we cannot shoot it. To do that, we need a variable to detect if we are allowed to pull the magnet. This will happen only if the mouse is at state attached. And if it is, we'll always try to go back to the start destination of the magnet. Again, we're using lerp, but this time for the pull. Now that we have our pull done, let's make it so our magnet pulls the object it's attached to. To do that, let's create a couple of checks. First, we would like to know what the position of our magnet is. For example, if it's at the start position, but also it has an object attached to it, that means we have already put an object. For grabbing the actual object, let's use fixed joint. Anytime we want to grab, we're going to set connected body to it. Again, we need to do a couple of checks to know when the magnet is ready to grab an object. The main ones search the state of the magnet, if it's not pulling something already, and if there is an object attached to it. If the conditions are met, we are able to pull the object and release it at any point as well. Creating different conditions will give you different results, depending on how you want your game to behave. Let's see another case, where instead of the magnet, we would like to convert this to a grappling hook, which is very similar but what we would need is a rope between our magnet and the shoot position. To do that, I have a line renderer attached to our hook, and also a new component for the hook. Because the rope is going to be attached to the hook at all times, this makes our job very simple. We need the line renderer and the starting position. For the first point of the line renderer, we're setting the starting position of our hook, and for the second, the current position. Our script already shoots the hook to a specific object, so we don't need to do anything extra. And as we can see, instead of a magnet, we have a hook with a rope. In a lot of games, there is a pickup mechanic. So with the next example, let's see how we can do that. When we are nearby an item, we would like to pull it to us and pick it up. For the setup, I have prepared green and red circles, which will represent our coins and the green ones are going to be the ones that we're going to pick up if we're in range. To detect when a coin is in range, we're going to use overlap circle O. It takes a first parameter, our character's position, 
second one is for the radius, and the third one is for the tags to search for. Again, similar to the physics raycast, we're going to be using specific tags to just get the objects that we want to. For example, the green coins are with tag collect, and this is the only tag we're passing currently as a third parameter. This means anything else won't be detected. Then we just loop through the found objects if there are any. For the green coins, we have a collect script. The purpose of it is to animate the coin so it pulls it towards the character. To do that, we need a variable is collecting to check if we have already started picking up the coin. And if you have, we just execute the move towards function, which will move it towards the character. And when it reaches the destination, we just delete the coin because we have collected it. For the next example, let's make a snake-like movement, where we will have a couple of boxes follow our main one. For the boxes that will follow, I have created a new box prefab specifically for them which contains a component that will do the movement. The idea here is to know the target that we're following and how much space do we want to have between two objects. As you can see, everything we have here, we have already used in the previous examples, getting the vector to the target between the two objects, looking at the correct rotation and checking for the spacing between them as well. This will be the script for the objects that are following. The main box will be acting differently because we just want to control it with our keys, so nothing special there. The last part will be to actually create the objects that follow. The way this works is every box will be the next one's target. For example, the second box will have the first one as its target. For the third, it will be the second and so on. This way, every box follows the previous one. That's how we can create this snake-like movement. Now let's combine both examples. We would like to have our snake to be able to eat the coins and grow. The only thing that we need to change for our coins is to get notified when the coin is being eaten. To do that, we are going to be using a callback. So every time a coin is eaten, it will notify us and we can create a new part. Because we are saving all the body parts in one place, we can just set the last one as the target for the new one we are making. Just by doing that, we can make a very cool snake-like game. What we have missing here for our game is to have the camera follow the character. We have previously seen how to do that, but let's bring it up a level. Not by difficulty by any means. We're going to be using this time Cinemachine to do that. First, we need to install the package and then create a new Cinemachine virtual camera. Inside it, we just have to set the object that we want to follow. And that's it. Without any code, we have our camera following our head of the snake. As we can see, the camera is going out of the map. So let's fix that. Again, we do not need to write any code. Create a new polygon collider and drag it in a way to cover all the parts of the map that you want to be visible. Then in our Cinemachine game object, let's add another component. That's called Cinemachine Confiner. And for the bounding shape value, set our polygon collider we just created. Now when we start the game, we can see that our camera no longer goes beyond the bounds we just set. For the last example, we are going to improve our gameplay a bit. As any snake-like game, we want to have the food spawned randomly around the map. To do that, we don't want to spawn it around the full map, of course, because it will be difficult to find, especially if the map is very large. So what we can do is place it on random places where our camera is, and we can just get the size of the camera, so we know the bounds where we should place the new spawned objects. And another thing we would like to have is to increase the speed of the snake when we click on the space button. Usually, it will be very simple, just by changing a value. But because our snake has many different parts that move individually, we need to change each one's speed separately. Probably the easiest way is to use loops. But I do not recommend that, because using loops is not always the best choice. And there is a way nicer way to do that. First, in our body part component, let's have a function that every time we call, we'll set the speed depending if the space is clicked or not. Then, in our main script, we're going to use something that's called delegates. Delegates, actions and events are something that you'll be using yourself a lot, because it just makes some things much easier. The way we're going to be using it, for every body part we're creating, we're adding the change speed function to our delegate. You can think of it as if we're creating a list of body parts change speed functions. And then we want to notify every function we just added in our delegate anytime there is a change. And this in our case is anytime we would hold the space. By doing that, every body part is being notified of any changes. And as we can see, the speed is changing accordingly. This was part 2 of the movement series. I think we covered a lot of cases and different scenarios anyone can encounter while making games. 
if you have any suggestions for other guys that you would like to see for Unity or other language, engine, whatever it is, please let me know in the comments below. I will also be releasing the full project in Git in the next week. I was thinking of doing it earlier, but I wanted to actually finish the series so you can have everything at once. I would really appreciate if you give this video a like and subscribe, as this helps me a lot. But even if you don't, thank you for watching and see you next time.